we were mixed start. <laughs> took me two years to get the plan, and then it took me uh, 12 months to move uh, Boeing 767, so there's a lot to be told there. But uh, I know you're anxious to get away, so we'll cut it fairly short. Um, look, I appreciate Paul for doing this, and Marie here, and uh, yeah, look, it'd be great that you all turned out for this. Uh, it means a lot to me. Because Marie, myself, Paul, and the lads here would look very foolish sitting around this table on their own. <laughs> so, I do appreciate it. We come from uh, West Sligo, but we're Sligo to the backbone, and always have been, always will be. And uh, I think the same as every one of you. I'm passionate about where I come from. I made the decision to move back from America get married, set up a business, send my kids to school, and keep running my business and expand it, and promote my town and county as best I could. I think most Ligo people do that. I remember when I went to Chicago in 1986, I was working with Tony Foley prior to that, in America Jardy, even though a lot of people don't know that. But I decided to go, because in 1986, Eastgate lost a senior football team, a soccer team, two pool teams, three darts teams, all in one 12 months. So I said, well, Jesus, I'm not going to be the last one left. <laughs> so I decided to take off myself because I could see the writing on the wall. And I decided to pr pursue a career that I like doing, and that's the funeral business. I work with people in the worst time of their lives. I work with them and spend days with them and talking to them and consoling them or doing my best. They've lost the most important thing in their lives. It can't be replaced. And I try to help those people as I do. And I went off to America because there was no embalmers in Ireland at the time and it was something that was coming out about six. We had a situation in Sligo one night, myself and Tony had to wait for somebody to come from Belfast to help us out. I said to Tony Foley that, that'll never happen to us again. So I set sail for Chicago, not knowing anybody out there. And I put myself through mortuary school. I was the first person to come back with a qualification in mortuary science. But after spending 12 months, I started to live a little bit out there in Chicago. It was a fun town. And I was fairly nippy at the football. So we joined a football called the McBride's football team. There I met a guy called Francie Lang from Colony and John Harden from Ballygawley. And the three of us clicked together because the three of us were from Sligo. And we started playing with the McBride and we did very, very, very well. And we, were, we won the league that year and we had a better team the next year. Until somebody walked into the restaurant one night and said, there's a bunch of lads setting up the Sligo club. And myself and John Harden and Francie Lang looked at each other and says, we're about to win the league next year. What in the name of God of the door? Can the not just wait another year? So the debate was on whether myself, Francie or, or John would leave the McBride team knowing that there was a big trophy at the end of the year. And we discussed it and we talked about it. But you know what? Knowing well that we could probably hardly fit a team, we decided to play for Sligo. And that's exactly what happened. We hardly were able to fill the team and the other team went on to win the league. But that's where our pride was. We wanted the black and white and we wanted to promote it. So that's the type of passion that I have in for my county. I had a good job in Chicago. I was employed by one of the biggest funeral homes there. And uh, they offered me a lot. But there was always a pull to come home. There's that gene in some of us that we just can it. You can put all you want on the table but you just want to come home. And that's exactly what I did do. And as soon as I came home, I started working with Tony Foley again in the market yard. And I said to Tony one day, he said, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to build a funeral home, Tony. I do in this town. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a debate going on where when I opened the funeral home. I wanted to open a purchase build a funeral home. So out of respect for Tony, I went and I opened one in Ballinagh. I spent five years trying to convince 
about me old people that bowed heads. Like old people were okay. <laughs> and in fairness, they were good to us. But I kept working with Tony. We kept right up to the day Tony passed away. <coughs> and Tony asked me to take over his business then. He said to me, keep it going for me. He was meant to come back or something. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, that's the passion I have for Sligo town and county. As I grew up in Sligo town, in Eastgate, I remember our childhood days. My father was drawing pigs into Denny's and I was brought and my job was to go into the ship in after the pigs was dropped and leave the price of three pints on the counter for the fellas in the ship in. We were pulling fertilizer out of Golden's. I knew all the lads down in Golden's yard and then I started driving myself. So we had a big connection with Sligo Town. Not many people know that. And um, that kind of gives you an insight to what I think. So when the opportunity came in this growing to do something, yes, I did think about Sligo again. I was offered a three acre site in Dublin to put the project there when the, when the word went out what I was doing. And I said, no, I'm going to do this here, this in my own county. And that I did. But there wasn't that, it wasn't that simple. It had to be something different. You had to go and look at what's going on out there. You had to look at how people are advertising. Social media is the biggest way of advertising your business now, so paper and TV is going down, so I thought about that. So whatever I did in my site in this going had to be Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, Blogger, friendly. <laughs> so that's exactly what it had to be. And from what I noticed and talked to people around, people in Ireland like big things. They like big occasions. So it had to be big as well. So I came up with the idea along with Aileen here myself and my wife here on the left hand side um, of turning, turning it into a glamping site. But then when I looked at the glamping, you know, it was just teepees and huts and trees and things like that. So the one thing I don't do is copy and paste. So I decided to come up with the theme myself of turning all types of transportation into accommodation. And I said, this will definitely be Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, blockers, um, day. So I didn't exclude the plane. So I uh, went searching for a plane, and I'm sure you know the story about that by now. But I worked on the, cut a long story short now, uh, I worked on the whole idea, found the plane, negotiated with an international airport. Now it just wasn't just an international airport, it was a 24 hour emergency airport as well, which was it left harder to shut down. But we did manage to convince the, the team below in Shannon to do it, and I mean they're still looking at me in the boardroom. I have to go back down and talk to one of them because he did say to me one day at a board meeting, he said, I can't understand we let you convince us to shut down an international airport, and especially a Schlego man. Now I had to take him up on the Sligo thing. <laughs> so I told him that. But we did it. We pulled off one of the biggest moves in the world. And yes, it was an opportunity for me again to show how passionate I am about my town and county. And it proves to anybody out there that if you have a dream, follow your dream, it'll work. And no matter what walls is put up in front of you, build a bridge and get over them. Simple as that. And I think I proved that. We did get to the social media, we did work a plan on that, I did my own PR work, and uh, it worked for me. We then in, entered the Richard Branson competition, I did get over to pitch in front of Richard Branson's crews. Each time we did that, we mentioned Sligo. Sligo was mentioned every part of this way. When I entered the the arena in London, that's something now I wasn't really used to. There was 500 people there, there was the biggest bloggers in the world there, there was the biggest tweeters in the world there, there was the biggest Facebook people in the world, there was the biggest Snapchat people in the world. They were all there. And to walk into that arena, that was something else, and I've learned something from that. But, my daughter Breed said to me inside, Dad, she said, somebody, you know, you've been feeling insecure, like, you know, if you're no, nobody there. And you walk into the centre of London and there's 500 people in there and that's what they are. 
And we were just kind of being shy and all that and stepping back because everybody is busy running here, there, everybody. Nobody has time to talk to you. You're going and getting the pictures. So my daughter Breed said to me, Dad, there's somebody here that knows you. And I said, what do you mean? I'm after here in Sligo being mentioned three times. I said, don't need that anyway. But she was right. All the tweeters, all the bloggers, all the Snapchat, all the Facebook, all the YouTube people were looking for the Sligo guy. <laughs> and they found us. And they asked me to do a pitch to them. And um, I did. I did a pitch for every single one of them. One thing that struck me was, each interviewer said to me, what part of Dublin is Sligo? <laughs> so, I've had to make a decision there. You get five minutes. So I decided to spend three minutes of that pitch telling people in the world where Sligo is and where it's situated in the country. And I did that to six of those people. Anyway, went into the arena and I pitched to Richard Branson's four or five judges or whatever and I came out and everybody was going away partying and I just said to Breach, do you know what, we'll never be in this place again, we'll never be in this arena again, why don't we stay here and mingle and mix with the people there. So I decided to do that and so did Breach. Afterwards we were allowed into the Richard Branson's canteen that was there for all the workers and Lord behold, who was in there but all the people that we pitched it that morning. And we sat around with them and I said to them, what sort of an audience was I talking to between the lot of you? So they all looked at each other and added it up. Between 55 and 60 million. That's the amount of people I told where Sligo was and where it's positioned in Ireland. Now, you probably couldn't buy that sort of market. You probably couldn't buy that. I then was on Radio Toronto for a few minutes. Anyway, when you go on to the big life thing, they tell you no marketing, no advertising. We want your story. That's what they all tell you. But anyway, when I got on to Radio Toronto, they had a problem pronouncing Sligo. Some of them called it Sligo, Sligo. So, I spelled S L I G five times so the researcher came back to me and she says you don't go anywhere for a minute I'm stay on the line so she did come back on the line and she said you milk that spelling thing <laughs> I says you did but you only gave me 10 minutes well you spelled it out to 1.8 million people you get an opportunity you take it and you run with it. So, anyone with a website with Sligo attached to it, Sligo Engineering, Sligo Electrical, Sligo Audit, Sligo whatever, if you type in how it works is it tags on and you can... Two local communities in Sligo rang me. They said, I think you might have something got to do with our website. And I said, no, I don't build websites, I do none of them. <laughs> well, they said, we have 500 hits on our website in 12 months. We walked in the other morning with 59,000. <laughs> that's the type of marketing that's going on out there. Yes, they, we, we, we did control it. I mean, everywhere we went, we just got on the media circle and we, you know, there's two TV companies, there's more coming now after this. Uh, RTE has decided to do a six series documentary on it. That's going to be promoting Sligo. And the one that was trying to get was the Jar George Clark and Mason Spaces. Well, his producer rang me last week said they're very interested in doing things. So you're looking at something like between 20 and 30 million people there. And hopefully we can showcase our county and town. That's the power of it. Um, it was a lot of hassle. Um, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of history has been made. Uh, bear in mind, the trucking company was telling Stephen there has never brought anything as big as that. A crane company has never gone out into the ocean to bring in something. Uh, timber mats have never been put out onto a beach. Uh, the marine people never uh, brought, as they said themselves, a cargo like it. And there was specific types of engineering in each aspect of the movie. 
I pulled together 35 groups of people, 35 groups of professionals. I made sure nobody crossed over on the other. I didn't allow the crane men get involved with the truck men. I wouldn't let the truck men get involved with the scene men. I didn't allow the contractors override and take over them. I formed groups of professional people. I brought them into Shannon Airport before we made the move and I said to them, the green button is pressed, all we're here. And I said, if this job fails, I will want to know which one of you 35 groups didn't do your job. <laughs> so I left there, I was in Clear Galway on the way back, when one of them rang me and told me, nobody moved for a half an hour after you left for that. <laughs> That's, that's the way it worked. And if you look at the videos at the airplane, that they'd actually changed their route and come to this school. And that they did. I met them on the site and I gave them a tour of the plane. And the two coach loads stayed in in this school for the day. They booked out the water pint and they also booked out three restaurants. That was a tour that was going to Westport that it diverted to Slyco. So. <laughs> get to meet you there on your bones, so I'm going to let you go, and again, thanks very much, I feel good about uh, being here, so does Amy, and I do have to thank my team down on the left hand corner there, at the, at the end of the room, they were pivotal to helping me out in the in the process, especially Martina Burns and stuff, and um, We have a lot of other things happening on the, on the scene too. There's a young lad down there, Matthew Cullen from Castle Connor, and I live in Castle Connor. Matthew has uh, invented a whip for horse racing, and both myself and Matthew are working on that. And that's something that could put Sligo on the world map as well, because there's nothing out there. And we just got our patent on it last year. Uh, there's a lot of eyes of the world in the racing industry looking at that. When we get our prototype finished, I was saying to Matthew, it would be great to get it tested in Sligo race course. And uh, that's what we're hoping to do. We just, we just need a little bit, about 10% to finish off the prototype again. The Australians are looking at it, the Americans are looking at it, there's a lot of people looking at it out there. It's now a rule now in the UK. It's not here in Ireland at the moment that you're only going to supposed to strike the animal eight times and seven times. And uh, there's about 2,000 violations of it since it was introduced. Uh, I was at a meeting the other day and uh, we all like race horses and we all like sport and it brings big revenue into Ireland but at the same time one has to stop and think as well. Bullfighting and race horses is the only sport in the world that you can publicly beat an animal. Now what we're saying is we're not eliminating it, we're putting in a restriction and we've come up with a device to do that. But again, it would be nice to see it hopefully maybe finished in the IT in Sligo and maybe tested for the first time on Sligo Racecourse. And that would be a big PR programme for the town as well. So, I'm going to leave you now and get back to Paul here.